We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, great. So, so, so now for something completely different. Um, actually, it's not completely different. Uh, we just heard two talks on on manipulating atoms in an array, and now I'm going to and how these were analogs of different sorts of glassy physics and stuff. And now I'm going to talk about uh, manipulating actual um, superconducting islands in an array, and uh, and showing the new physics that emerges in this case. Um, and I'll be talking about um, two different sets of experiments. And the first one I'll talk about. Um, controlling superconducting interactions between niobium islands on gold substrates and how we use these systems to study um, emergent behavior such as low temperature metallic states which appear. Um, and then I'll talk about how we also use these systems to study vortex interactions um, and, and pinning in a finite magnetic field. We see things like unusual deep pinning transitions. Okay, so this is a workshop on engineering quantum materials. And so our contribution to this is trying to engineer the properties of two-dimensional superconductors. Um, so the first question is, why do we care about 2D superconductors? Um, the answer is lots of reasons. Um, uh, 2D is the lower dimension for having long-range correlations, and so these turn out to be really great systems for studying competitions between things that we care about in condensed matter physics, like Cooper pairing, localization, uh, Coulomb repulsion, disorder, dissipation. Uh, in addition, these systems are expected to undergo transitions from uh, superconductor to insulator um, states, for example, or sometimes superconductor to metallic states. These transitions are tuned by disorder, magnetic field, temperature. Um, here you can see an example from Alan Goldman's group from many years ago, this canonical superconductor insulator transition, where it's a quantum phase transition between a superconducting and an and a insulating state as you approach zero temperature. Um, and so these sort of um, zero temperature quantum phase transitions are common in condensed matter systems. So this is really a paradigm paradigmatic system for studying these. Um, and these transitions also appear in things like quantum Hall systems, um, Joseph Junction arrays, high TC superconductors. And so they're really interesting for studying parameters relevant to this. And finally, as I'll show, the things that are important to, this, to these transitions and these 2D superconductors are things like the role of understanding the role of disorder, understanding the role of phase separation, understanding the effect of dissipation. Um, and these are things that are common not just to 2D superconductors, but really to almost all 2D systems, um, from high DC to graphene to topological insulators. So we'll touch on these things as well. So one of the questions that we've been asking, um, me for a while now, is, is in, in, with respect to 2D superconductors, what is the nature of the, of the ground state in a 2D system that has superconducting correlations? Now, it seems like a very basic question, but um, it turns out to be a little bit complicated, and this is because According to the scaling theory of localization, as you go to low enough temperature um, in 2D, any small amount of disorder should trap all your electronic wave functions and lead to an insulating state. Okay, so um, as you approach zero temperature, you can have um, a superconductor, so you can have a correlated system, or you can have an insulator, but you should not have a metal, theoretically. Which is fine, but experimentally for many years, uh, there's been evidence of 2D metallic states as the temperature is lowered, and these have really not been well understood. And these have appeared in superconducting systems and semiconducting systems. Um, I admit this is an old problem for me. This is from my own thesis work on 2D metallic states. You can see uh, resistance versus temperature. As the temperature is lowered, you start saturating out into what seems like a finite resistance, which is just not understood theoretically. In many of these systems, there's been an ongoing question of, what causes these sort of anomalous metallic states and what really happens to the ground states of lower dimensional systems. Um, and there's been a lot of theoretical work um, trying to understand these metallic states. Um, and these days, uh, the, the, the theory has really converged on the idea that, that these low temperature metallic states are likely due to phase separated junction-like systems, for example, um, little tiny islands of superconductor embedded in a metal in some highly conducting network. This is a paper by a speedback with Kibbelson et al. And you can see here you expect um, as, you, as you make the superconducting islands further and further apart, you get a transition from a superconductor to a phase-separated system to a metal. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in trying to see, are these theories correct? Can we get metallic states out of this? Um, and finally, this idea of phase separation itself, I think, is relevant to, to many sorts of low-dimensional systems. Um, in general, if you take a 2D film, whether it's a topological insulator or graphene, um, and put it on a substrate, there'll be disorder. And that disorder tends to make the system phase separate into some sort of inhomogeneous system. And this is seen, like I said, in, in, in TIs, in, 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 in high TC, in graphene. And so I think it's still not well understood what is the nature of phase transitions in these sort of inhomogeneous phase separated systems and, uh, and what are the ground states here. 
Okay, so this all motivated us to try to create a model, <coughs> phase separated interacting system and then see what sort of physics emerged and how we can compare it to, to the physics that's seen in other systems. Okay, so there's our, our model, our very simple model, uh, phase separated system. It's a system of superconducting islands on a metallic substrate. This would be a top view, this is a side view. Okay, so the idea here is that we just um, so these, these, uh, these superconducting islands interact via the metallic substrate. So um, if you have phase coherence between these superconducting islands, then you can pass pairs between them, basically. And if you don't have phase coherence, then you don't get a supercurrent across the system. Now, I should mention that for, I'll be talking about transport experiments where we measure, um, the, we measure the, the resistance of the underlying gold, which will see a supercurrent pass between the islands all the way across the sample when they're phase coherent. Okay? And these things are, are phase coherent up to the, the coherence length of the normal metal. Okay, so obviously you need to have coherence across this length, and the coherence length of the normal metal is given here. It's related <coughs> to the diffusivity of the metal, but also inversely related to the temperature. So you can see that it, theoretically, as you approach zero temperature, even two islands that are infinitely par, far apart should be coherently coupled. Okay, that's what's expected. Um, and then also, just to note that within each island, you, there's a BCS coherence length in the dirty limit here, um, where we expect phase fluctuations at lengths less than this coherence length. Okay, so this is the sort of system that we, that we made. It's, it's a model, phase-separated, uh, 2D superconducting system. Uh, this is a, an AFM image of actual superconducting niobium islands, false colored, but still islands, on, on a gold substrate. Um, and then we pattern these islands on top of something that's just four point patterned in gold. So we just put a current on the outer ends, measure the voltage in the middle, and then we can see what sort of phase transitions occur as we change the properties of these islands. And this is a nice system for us because it's very, very configurable. So each of these islands is laid down using electron beam lithography, so we have complete control over almost all properties of it. So uh, we can tune the island size, uh, tune the island spacing, which tunes their coupling and the effects of dissipation from the underlying metal. Uh, we can change the materials. Here I'll talk only about niobium islands on gold. Um, we've also done experiments of tin on graphene and aluminum on topological insulators, all of which show interesting things as well. I won't show that today. Um, we have many, many islands, 10 to 30,000 of these. That way we're not dominated by any individual properties of the junctions, but they just average out to a homogeneous superconductor when we measure transport. Um, and finally, we have total control over the array configuration. So um, if someone said, you know, out of these 30,000 islands, take out this one island, we can do that, right? Because everything is just placed there um, totally controllably. So um, this is now an intrinsically phase-separated system, like we want to study, where we have really controllable pair and vortex interaction lengths and configurations. And now we can use this to tune parameters that might be relevant to understanding things like metallic state or correlation lengths or vortex dynamics. Okay, and just to note, this is just an example of a, of a Josen junction, of SNS Josen junction array, um, but it's at small scales with, with more precise control than has been done, uh, than was done previously, so we do see new things. Okay, just some, some things about the, the sample. Uh, so the, the superconductor is, is typically 90 to 150 nanometers thick, the normal metal is 10 nanometers thick, and so we're in a regime where all the normal metal under the superconductor is fully superconducting. Um, we actually measured that here. It looks pretty much like you'd expect for a single niobium layer. Uh, the island diameter I'll talk about now are about 260 nanometers, and you can see that this is um, much larger than the superconducting coherence length. The islands are larger than the coherence length. Um, of the superconductor and the normal metal coherence length is also given here. So in general, the island diameter is bigger than the superconducting coherence length. And also, the island spacing is larger than the normal metal coherence length at at the transition temperature of niobium. So that means that when we undergo the transition temperature of niobium, we expect first to see the islands go superconducting, and then as the temperature is lowered and the coherence length is equivalent to the spacing, then the whole rate goes superconducting. Okay, so um, the first set of experiments we did is we took a chip and we put, um, we did everything identically, put all the metals on the same way, but, in fact, but, but, um, but changed the island spacing. And so we had six different devices with different spacings, but everything else was identical. Here's some examples of different spacings on a device. Um, and then we just do standard four-point um, AC locking <coughs> measurements at low temperatures and measure the resistance of the gold and see where, um, where we see um, supercurrents in here. And this is the typical data that we see. 
Um, and you can see that we, we indeed see, um, see transitions, in fact, two-step transitions, and the tr transitions go to lower temperatures as the island spacing is increased as you'd expect, so here's for closely spaced islands. And it's nice, you can see that for the most closely spaced islands, we get transitions near nine Kelvin that tells you we're not suppressing anything really with the gold. And as we space the islands further, this transition is suppressed down to lower temperatures. And you can see it's a two-step transition, a high temperature transition and then a low temperature transition. I mean, this two-step transition is expected, as we said, as I said, not me. I'm sorry, um, individual. <laughs> the first you get the TC of the individual islands, and then as you lower the temperature, the normal metal coherence length increases until it's equivalent to the spacing between the islands, and then the islands are coupled here, and you get superconductivity across the array. Okay. Um, so first I just want to mention uh, T2 um, briefly. Okay, so, so the second transition here really acts like a standard 2D superconducting transition. It acts like a, a BKT transition. Um, we see things like jumps in our IV curves. I won't show that. Um, but they're there. Um, this really signifies that, the, that it behaves like a 2D superconductor. And so that's nice because it shows us that below, below this transition, we can really um, study the behavior of a 2D superconductor, but in a very configurable system. Um, we also see that the critical current fits well as for a single uh, diffusive junction, and, the, and we're in the long junction limit where the transition temperature goes as 1 over d squared. So um, here you can see, for example, that resistance versus temperature, you get one transition and then a second transition down to zero resistance. And, um, and we get predicted behavior of temperature going as the phallus length. Okay, so that's for, that's for a sort of close spacings. This is up to spacings up to uh, 690 nanometers. But then one question you might ask is what happens as the spacing is increased, right? Because then you expect to see, you know, in theory, as you make these things infinitely far apart and lower the temperature, you should still just get a superconducting state. But in addition, we have this underlying metal where, you know, it's not clear how dissipation and other things might come into the sample. Um, and it's actually been predicted in these phase separation theories that, for example, by Spivak et al., that as you, as you make these islands further and further apart, this is the inverse density of superconducting islands, you should make a transition to a metallic state. And so here's our equivalent plot of transition temperature versus inverse island density. And you know, it kind of, kind of looks like that line. And so you might ask, what happens as we get out to, to very sparse islands? Um, to be fair, we never come close to what they predict for the metallic state. They predict something that's extremely sparse, and we never come close to that sparsity. Um, nonetheless, we in fact see uh, metallic states start to appear as we increase the island spacings a lot. And you can see that here, resistance versus temperature, that for closely spaced islands, we transition to zero resistance. And then as we make the spacings further and further apart, we start seeing things lift up from zero, and then again, these saturation of resistance points for further and further spaced islands. Um, and we can show for lots of reasons that this is not due to a thermal effect, that it's actually a real effect, due to a, coupling, a direct coupling and a dissipation as you increase the spacing between these islands. Um, and this is consistent with what's been seen in sort of thin film systems, but it hasn't really been parametrized before in terms of dissipation. Um, and it's really consistent with some sort of vortex tunneling in a dissipated system. Okay, so this is metallic state one <laughs> in, in, in the second transition. I now want to talk about the first transition here. Um, this is T1, where the islands transition. So we were just talking about T2, and you expect this to be dependent on spacing because uh, the second transition occurs when the islands are coupled. But the first transition is the island transition, and so you wouldn't expect that to depend on coupling at all, right? That should just be when the individual islands go superconducting. And yet, surprisingly, you can see that this transition does depend on island spacing. And so now the question is, you know, what does that mean, and what does it, what does it imply? So we measured this on a, bunch, a ton of samples, and you can see every time that we get this first island transition um, is suppressed with island spacing. We get it for, for thinner niobium and for thicker niobium. You can see we get higher TCs, but we still get this suppressed transition. This is really unexpected because the islands are pretty large. They're much larger than the coherence length of niobium. They should just be sort of bulk superconductors. That's what we expected. And yet we see that we get this dependence on island spacing unexpectedly. If you plot this um, transition versus island spacing, you can see that we get a linear suppression, right? So these different curves represent different heights of niobium and different resistances of the gold. These are just things that change the coupling, right? So um, if you change the coupling, you can change the slope of this line, but we always see a linear suppression of the transition with spacing. You can go to larger island spacings, and we still see a linear suppression of the transition with spacing, okay? So, so what does this mean? It means that 
if we have this linear suppression of this first transition with spacing, it means that as we increase the island spacing, we can extrapolate out to some finite spacing where we get to a transition at zero temperature. And if the transition's at zero temperature, then again, that's an example of a finite resistance zero temperature state. Right, so here's now in T1, it's like taking this point and just marching it to increase spacing and marching it back down to zero until you have really no superconductivity at all and just a metal at zero temperature where you wouldn't actually predict one. Okay. So this is another example of a sort of zero temperature metallic state that appeared in, in these samples here at, at normal state resistance rather than even a suppressed resistance. Okay, okay so, so what's causing this approach to metallic state? Um, the first thing to note is that the suppression of T1 with with, with spacing implies that individual islands are not superconducting, right? So if they only become superconducting as I start coupling them together, and the limit is I have infinitely spaced islands, I don't see any superconductivity at all. Um, and I, I unfortunately won't have time, we understand this now, it's actually due to granularity of the islands, it's a really interesting story in itself, and I'm not gonna talk about that, um, because you could ask me questions, but, but, uh, but, but we also know that then what, what suppresses superconductivity below TC is phase fluctuations, and so somehow we must be damping phase fluctuations by coupling these islands together. Okay. Um, but but the, the interesting thing here is that note that when we couple these islands together at, at T1, right, they're not coherently coupled because they only become coherently coupled at the array transition. Right? This is where you have, you have the, the coherence length is equal to the spacing, and the islands drop to zero resistance. And so the coupling we see up here is something different. It's something more local, it's not completely phase coherent, and yet it's enough of a coupling to stabilize each island's superconductivity. And so what we've done is we've kind of stabilized a regime that's not global coupling, but not non-coupling either, as so we call it regional coupling. And this is interesting because a lot of systems, you know, even like high TCs and things, see situations where you have sort of lo local, local gaps and local coupling, but not long-range coupling. And this is another an example of where you can actually see these two things on very largely separated energy scales. Um, and then on top of that, it's an example of this finite resistance region, which can persist as the temperature approaches zero. So it's another example of how you might um, get a zero temperature metallic state. And just to note, I'm not saying that, that we really have um, a finite resistance at exactly t equals zero, but it shows how you can approach these states experimentally and what, might, you know, what we might really be seeing in other sorts of um, samples. Okay, so that was, that was part one of this very brief talk, um, talking about the coupling between the islands. And, and now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about, um, about vortex interactions in these systems, because we also see a lot of really interesting um, magnetic field behavior and coupling between vortices, again due to this periodic arrangement that we have of the islands. Okay, so, so in this case we have, um, in, in 2D superconductors, magnetic fields penetrate as vortices. These are just circulating currents containing a flux quantum. Um, you can think of the excitations of the superconductor, and so uh, they'll pin at a point where you have the weakest link of the superconductor. So we have a, a triangular array. We can have any sort of array. This work with square array or anything, but we choose a triangular array of niobium islands. Um, and so uh, we expect, in this case, to have the lowest um, energy um, for vortices to penetrate at the center of these. So if you consider a plaquette, the triangle between the islands, the vortices, the, the lowest energy pinning site should be at the center of these plaquettes because that's furthest from the superconductors, and the highest energy site should be at the edges um, that connect the islands. Um, so we expect the vortices to sit in the center of these plaquettes. <coughs> okay. um, and then we can characterize how the magnetic fields penetrate, especially you know, for, for relatively low fields, by what's called a, a filling factor or a frustration parameter. So this is just um, the field divided by the number of, of, of vortices, or in other words, the number of vortices per plaquette. Okay. So it's a field parameter, but it also tells us how many vortices we have compared to the total number of plaquettes in our sample. Um, so here, for example, if we have F equals one-fourth, we have one-fourth filling of our plaquettes. And this manifests itself in transport because due to vortex interactions, we expect to have um, strong pinning at commensurate values of F. So when you have an array of vortices, those interact, they're strongly pinned, and so if you measure resistance, you get a, a lower resistance than you do if you don't have a commensurate value of filling. Um, and this can be shown very clearly in, in data. Um, this is resistance versus the frustration parameter. Um, these are just different temperatures, but you can see very clearly that at the zero field, you have zero resistance, and then at a quarter field, you drop again. At a half, 
at three quarters, and at one, all of the resistance is interesting. You're, you're increasing field, but as you get to a fully filled plaquette, all of the resistances drop to zero, even at higher temperatures. Okay. And so, so this shows you that, that we really have very strong vortex dynamics, strong pitting potentials, and it's a very nice system to look at the interactions, the, at, the, at the interplay between um, vortex interactions and pinning potentials. Okay, so, so we've been interested in looking at this vortex depinning behavior. Okay, um, so you can have a thermal or current driven depinning. This gives you a lot of really rich non equilibrium dynamics. Okay, so we're driving, we will be driving vortices with a current, and, and we want to see what sort of non equilibrium behavior emerges. Um, this, is an, you know, this is really. Um, this has been long, you know, interesting for many years, looking at vortex dynamics. We, I mean, you've heard people talk about glassy physics. This is you know, one of the great examples where you expect to see glassy physics, um, vortex fluids, Meissner states. You see all of these sorts of behavior, but now in these vortex systems. Okay, so um, there's been a lot of study of, of thermally driven transitions. If you have deep pinning or melting of different types of lattices, um, you know, some sort of more recent papers on coexistence of ordered phases and <coughs> stable disordered phases and seeing the dynamics of those. Um, there's also been a lot of these are a lot of interest in in um, current deep pinning. Uh, this is when you have pinning and interactions which are stronger than the thermal fluctuations. That's what I'll talk about. Um, and here again, you expect all sorts of dynamic um, phases. Um, this is this here is a, is a recent paper um, on using a, a, a sample that's almost identical to what to what we make, and they, they drive their their vortices um, at commensurate filling values. Here's a filling of one with a high current, and they claim to see a direct mod insulator to metal transition, and you can see the quantum critical scaling of this transition as expected. Okay, so even in what seems like an old topic, um, with, with these devices where you have very strong pinning, and you can also drive them out of equilibrium, you can still see new sorts of physics. Okay, so we're looking at, at this current deep pinning. Um, so we do IV measurements, basically you, you just put a current across it, the vortices have a Lorentz force, if they move across a sample, you get a voltage in that case. Uh, this is resistance versus driving current. Uh, in, in this in this vice as a function of magnetic field. I should note that here I'll be talking about relatively small fields. You can see these are fillings of, of much less than one, actually less than a quarter, so mostly non-commensurate field values. Uh, here these peaks are where we have the critical current. This is differential resistance. The peak is where we have critical current of the superconductor. And note we're actually looking at the, this is this is all the 2D superconductor below T2, so it should really be like a 2D superconductor. Here's a critical current of the array, right, and then it drops the normal resistance. The critical current of the islands themselves is way, way up there somewhere. Okay, this is a critical current of the array, normal resistance, and then in here, where you see this sort of finite resistance region, this is where we have vortex-dominated behavior. Okay, so this is still superconducting, but vortices are dominating in here. Okay, and so we could take this, this is DVDI, we just show it as an ID curve, uh, you can see that we have um, pin vortices out to some current, and then they, they transition into a linear IV regime where the vortices are flowing as a fluid. Okay, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's here, it's still superconducting, but we have a vortex flux flow in this regime. Okay, um, and, and, and in this regime in general, you can show the flux flow resistance um, just scales with the number of vortices as you'd expect. And so it's really, um, for, for, for low fields, it's very typical flux flow resistance of the vortices. Okay, so, so now we care about looking at what the effects of our inter of intera of vortex interactions in this in these in the um, in the deep pinning regimes, and to do that we just mark where we deep pin. And so out here we have zero resistance, right? And then you can see there's a transition to a linear resistance, and this transition occurs at we call at what we call the deep pinning current. Okay, so we just mark that you, I mean, we have ways of actually doing it systematically, but we we, we plot where this deep pinning current is the function of field. Right? And you can see we get a plot like this, where this is the deep pinning current, and this is the field. And you can see that there are various regimes here. We have a regime where we get a sharp drop in the deep pinning current, and then it sort of flattens out, and then it drops down to zero, and then it goes up again. And we're interested in trying to understand what these different regimes are and how they manifest themselves in the dynamic behavior. Okay, so uh, we worked with our theory colleagues who just modeled the vortices as really the basic tilted washboard potential model, where you have vortices and a periodic potential, and you have you know, an effective array potential, vortex interactions, thermal fluctuations, and dissipation. Um, and then just using that model, they compared it to our data, and they could show something that looks like this, where you know, in region A, they have an edge potential, in region B, they have something else in region C. So now we can directly compare um, 
what sorts of behavior we expect to, to what we actually observe. And we can show by comparison to the model that in this region is dominated by edge barriers. And so it's really a Meissner-like region, even for a 2D superconductor, you may not expect that very well. This is to be a very strong pinning. Um, this edge barrier region is very susceptible to magnetic fields, so it drops very rapidly. Um, the next region here, we have a relatively flat region here where we're independent of, of field. This tells us we have a really single vortex behavior, non-interacting behavior here. And then as we increase the field, we start getting to vortex interactions as it drops down. And then this peak over here is where we have commensurate lattice pinning. So by comparing our model to the experiment, we can show both the Meissner-like state as well as a field-dependent crossover to where we have vortex interactions. We can tell where that matters. Um, and also we can see things like a transition from a vortex liquid down here to a vortex glass over here. And you can start the scaling of these transitions. Okay. So, so this was interesting, sort of knowing where interactions occur, where the crossover occurs, but now we want to compare the actual dynamic behavior of the vortices by driving them with a current and seeing what different dynamic behavior we see now that we know what the different interaction regimes are. Okay, so we want to see what happens in low current versus high current, low field versus high field, commensurate versus non-commensurate. 